Yeah, again, uh, I'm Jeff Cola. Um, last name's Cola, like Coca-Cola, so that's kind of easy to remember. Um, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I, I grew up here um, in Strongsville, about uh, about 30 minutes south. Um, uh, played baseball, played played football and basketball as well in high school, um, and went on to play baseball at University of Toledo for four years. Um, we got Steven now too, <laughs> Steve Visual. There we go. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I played I played ball at Toledo for four years, um, and I in my time there I earned a master's degree in education. Um, you know I've been I've been coaching and teaching since. Um, couple two biggest things that I do in coaching is um, I give private baseball instruction, softball and baseball. Um, the cool part about that is I have ages six to twenty two, so I have. From you know, you know, first grade to Division One athletes, um, it's it's pretty cool to see the variety there um, and to be able to put my input in all that. Um, and I was introduced to PCA through um, the Cleveland Indians youth baseball program. Um, Jim Bucci came in and and talked with us, um, and I've been excited about that ever since that that day I met met Jim. Um, you know, I'm just excited to kind of reach out to to kids and and help them understand, you know, sports can can really help them and, you know, life lessons and, you know, kind of teach us a lot of things along the way and, and just how cool sports can really be. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll jump into, um, um, you know, Elm Tree here. So um, we know Elm Tree is um, – Elm Tree of Mastery is this first big principle that, that coaches should kind of – take into their repertoire and really start um, implementing. Um, and I really like this word mastery. So just real quick, I know you guys know this, but, you know, what, do, what does mastery kind of mean to you or, you know, gut reaction, what's kind of your definition of mastery? I would say mastery is when you're really, really good at something. Mm-hmm, definitely. And, and my question from there, is that something that, you know, kind of happens overnight, or is that, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I think you have to work at it. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, to me, it, it's kind of a, a long process. Um, it takes a lot of hard work to really master something, to be, um, you know, really, really good at something, like you said, Kelly. Um, so, again, that, that word mastery, before we even get into what EL and M stand for, um, is something that I really look at, you know, that, that we should start thinking about and getting our, our student athletes to be thinking about as well. Um, the next slide is the first video clip, which I, I know you guys know. Um, and if we showed, um, again, we would talk about, you know, he talks about a real good effort, but, you know, he's really concerned about winning and he's not going to accept anything else other than winning. Um, and again, the, the next slides, you know, from here are really going to talk about the difference between, you know, the fine line between, you know, winning at all cost, you know, our scoreboard definition and, um, and our mastery definition. So slide 14 um, is, you know, that, that question of which Olympic athletes earn the most medals, um, the ones that focus on scoreboard the scoreboard and winning, or those who focus on mastering their sport and getting better. Um, again, we know this, but you know this is a, a research done in the early 2000s, um, and that question is, you know, and and as we you know talk about that, you know, that's something we can kind of get the um, the crowd involved in. Um, you know, nothing too long, but um, understanding that number two is probably the correct answer there. Um, you know, those who are who focus on mastering their sports and getting better. Um, you know, again, why is why is that the correct answer? Um, and, and now we're going to start looking at, you know, really comparing the two, um, the two of those, looking at the scoreboard or um, um, mastering um, our sport. So on, pay, or on slide 16, you see the, the definitions of both. Um, First thing that, that I want you to look at is, is the definition of mastery. Okay, so we have effort, learning, and knowing that mistakes are okay. Um, and when we, when we look at this, we, 
um, you know, a scoreboard definition or a scoreboard winning coach is really um, driving from results. He wants results. He wants to win at the end of the game, um, and that's what he's concerned with. What we need as coaches and what we should be communicating with our student athletes is that we should be looking at the effort that it's taking to win the game, all right? And the, and the biggest thing for me is that this is a whole big, long process. So this big, long process towards mastering our sport. Um, and, and one of the big, biggest examples I have this specifically from teaching is teaching math. Um, teaching math in especially like 8th and ninth graders. 8th and ninth graders can be a little crazy at times and, and a little picky at times and all they want is that end result. You know, they're like, Mr. Cole, how can I get to the how can I get the answer as fast as I can? You know, I don't want to do all this extra work. Um, and it's my job to help them understand this is a process, you know, this is the formula, these are the steps that we have to take in order to get to get the final answer. Um, and th and that's honestly a, kind of a hard thing for students to understand, you know, why would we go through that? Um, and I really think, you know, especially when we get to test and, and a sports example is our game, um, you know, we put in so much work with homework and practice and all that is, but, you know, when, we're, when we have a test, you know, I, I look at all these steps that they take towards their final math answer. Um, and from there I can go back and I can see, well, you put good effort in here, um, you know, you did this step correctly, you know, but at the very end maybe you made a silly mistake. So, you know, I relate that back to, to sports where, hey, your effort was great, you know, you did everything you could, you followed kind of our approach, but something happened at the end of the game, maybe that wasn't under our control, and maybe that's what ended up losing the game for us. Um, so it's, it's looking again at, at this whole process of things instead of, um, instead of looking at, you know, the end result, how can I get to it right away, and, and that's what I'm concerned of, you know, I, that's what, you know, I'm, I'm not happy with the result, okay, but if we're not happy with the result, let's look back at the process and see, see how we did. Um, another thing that I mentioned on, on some of our discussion points was with youth, youth baseball, we talk about um, ACE, so in, in looking at um, mastery, effort, learning, and mistakes, we can also add attitude and concentration. Um, the biggest thing that I like about effort, learning, mistakes, and as well as attitude and concentration, none of these things really have anything to do with winning. You know, this is, this is really, they all have to do about the process towards winning. Um, again, looking at, you know, the scoreboard definition, um, you know, comparing to others, all right, we have to worry about what we're doing, not really looking at what others are doing. Um, and again, we're, we know that mistakes are okay. Mistakes are going to happen. Um, as long as our effort's there, you know, mistakes can happen, and, and we're going to learn from those mistakes. Um, so on, on slide 17, um, again, we're kind of, excuse me. So as, so as coaches kind of accept and, and implement this um, mastery, um, or process as coaching, um, we're really going to start to look at, you know, what this does to our players, okay? So how do our players really respond to this types of coaching? Um, and something that has shown through research is that when we have this approach coaching, um, they're really going to have their anxiety go down. And, and that anxiety kind of comes from, you know, I'm really worried that I'm going to I'm gonna get yelled at if I make a mistake or, um, you know, I'm going to get yelled at or we're going to have to run um, after we, you know, if we lose or something like that. So I think it's, it's, it's a great way of looking at that. You know, if I get a, a, a team full of, a team full of, players that, you know, their, their anxiety is down, then, you know, we should, we should be in a good situation. Um, at the same time, that goes hand in hand with their self-confidence is going to go up. You know, they kind of have this, I can do this mentality, or, you know, I'm in the driver's seat mentality that, you know, I can control the things we talked about 
effort learning mistakes um, and I can you know I can do this um, so again anxiety is going to go down self-confidence is going going to go up just from getting away from worrying about results um, and worry, you know not worrying about some mistakes so um, this gets uh, gets us to slide 18 um, where again talking about players it gives players a feeling of control um, they really feel like you know they can control those, those things effort they can learn from their mistakes um, and again their their attitude and concentration are two more things that I like to throw in there they can control those things um, and when they focus on these things um, instead of the result or instead of you know trying not to make mistakes um, they focus on the things they can control you know not the scoreboard not the umpire not the field you know what court whatever it might be um, they actually will tend to work harder you know when when they know that those things are you know they're in the driver's seat to kind of helping themselves out um, you know working hard you know they're, they're going to end up working harder because of their their effort their attitude and their concentration um, and one of the biggest things I like is if they know it's a process you know they're going to stick to it longer um, you know all of my you know great coaches throughout the years said we're trying to play our best um, you know our, our best baseball our best best game by the end of the year so us as players we knew it's gonna be a process we knew we had to keep working on the same things um, through that process to get better um, and I really think as players it helped us stick through a long season um, and this actually happened to me last night. I'm, I'm excited to share. Um, I had a senior in high school, a softball player. Um, she's going to a Division three school to play ba to play softball, but she was her anxiety was through the roof just when she walked in because they're getting a new head coach um, her senior year of high school. Um, and you know she was worried about playing time, and she wasn't a starter last year, and she thought she would be, but she doesn't know what this new guy's gonna think. Um, and I just had to calm her down and, and really let her know, like, hey, you've been working really hard. You you know do great in the classroom. You know you you've been in here hitting, you've been in here catching. Um, your work ethic is there. Your effort has been there. You've learned from your mistakes throughout the years, um, and you can't. You can't even worry about the, the past right now. You can't worry about what's going to happen in the future. All you know is that, you know, there's three weeks until tryouts, and, and that's kind of under your control of how you prepare for that. Um, and, and if the coach makes some sort of decision of, um, you know, playing time or anything other than that, like cutting players come tryouts, you know, that's, that's not under your control, but you can control how hard you work and, how well you lead and everything like that. So it was kind of cool to see that kind of come off her face and kind of understand that and say, hey, yeah, I'm in the driver's seat and I, c I can do this. Um, so that, no, that was a that was a great um, thing to be part of last night. Um, okay, two minutes left. Um, the a scenario here um, when we look at players in inside of a game. Um, Slide 19 talks about um, a student athlete that that gets mad every time he misses a shot. You know, he hangs his head and he doesn't get back on defense. Um, something that I would communicate with my players, you know, before a game starts is, you know, after something negative happens in your mind, negative happens like missing a shot. Let's go through the process in our mind, and that will kind of tell us, you know, what I can learn from or what I can do better. Um, so was it a good time to take a shot? Was it the right situation? Was my form good, et cetera, et cetera? Um, you know, student athletes can kind of go through that that in their mind and see, you know, is that something that um, you know I should have done or not, or what can I learn from that? Um, my big biggest example, since you know that's something I've lived, is, is having a, a bad at bat or even a good at bat, you know, and it, it kind of determines how you look at it. I can take the best swing of my life and hit a real hard line drive somewhere, but the guy catches it, and it's not the result I want. But if I look back and, you know, I know it was the right pitch to swing at, I know it was the right count to swing at that pitch, I know it was a good swing, you know, so I go through this process and everything else was good, then I know that, hey, that's a good at bat, even though my result isn't what I wanted. 
Um, so I think talking through that with with the athletes, with our with our players, can really be beneficial to not having guys um, kind of lose their cool out there. Um, and last thing, real quick, if I have enough time, you know, mistake rituals. Um, we talk about doing different things to help us flush, you know, bad things that have happened. So yeah, maybe it's a bad at bad. Maybe you made an error in the field. Um, you know, I I'll try to make it some sort of physical movement to kind of remind ourselves to, to flush that, get rid of that, and, you know, who cares about that one? Let's move on to the next pitch um, or what, whatever it might be next play. Um, you know, again, some sort of physical movement, whether it's actually flushing a, a toilet, you know, wiping it off our brow. Um, I know for baseball I, I would like to pick a spot, you know, on the field or on my bat, and, you know, give myself a real good deep breath and really, you know, understand, okay, that one's gone, and now I can move on to the next thing. Um, and, again, that's in, that's on page 23 in the book as well. So. Yep, that's it. Great. You're going to stop. Thank you. <laughs> can't turn my thumb on. Nice job. Nice job. Thank you. Okay. Stop. All right, how'd you feel, Jeff? Okay, yeah, it's um, you know, it's it's cool because this is stuff I've been kind of living and breathing before I even knew about PCA, um, and kind of that mental side of of baseball and all sports, and you know, how can we you know keep our cool out there and you know control the things we control? You know, I've I've just been blessed with really good coaches who have talked about that, and so that's why the first time I met Jim was like. It's like, wow, I've been doing this stuff, and how cool would that be for me to, to kind of relate, you know, what I've been through, what my coaches have said to, you know, like I said, you know, Strongsville baseball clubs, Stallions baseball club that, you know, I grew up playing with. So it's just a, a cool experience for me, and I'm excited to kind of get going with this. So. All right. Thanks. What I'd like to do is just have everybody just say a positive, something that you, uh, you really liked about what Jeff just did. Definitely. Um, Steve, I don't know if you were in on any of it, or some of it, most of it. We can't hear you. <laughs> he doesn't know we can't hear him. We can't hear you. No. All right, Ruben, why don't we start with you instead, while Steve figures that out. Okay. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I know it's one positive, but I'm going to say two because I, they're, they're quick. You can do uh, Jeff, I think you have very good mastery of the content, the flow, the format, the slides, mm -hmm. what we want the videos to accomplish. Right. Knowledge of the content, I think, is pretty strong. Uh, I really like that right when you got into Elm, after your two-minute intro, uh -huh. you immediately asked us a question, mm -hmm. and, then you asked us, and then you asked a follow-up question, which immediately got our voices and thoughts into the the, the room and uh, I like that Great. right off the bat thanks alright I was gonna say similar I mean I think you obviously are living this which is really obvious that uh -huh. it's necessarily something you just memorized that you are actually you've been coaching this way and I, I think that's that's very obvious to me as an audience the mm -hmm. other thing that I loved was um, your, when you tell a story about a player, your whole face lights up, and <laughs> and that's so much more engaging. That I mean, you can just tell when you're telling a story about a player or something. You were talking about a softball story, and you have even in your math class, you know, with eighth and ninth graders, your whole face lights up, and you're you know that's that's just so that that emotion there is is more powerful than you think because right. it's something that you're doing, and you're like, yeah, this is really great. And the softball yeah. story, you know, this is something that really worked, and I want to share this. That's really awesome. So. Thanks. I think it's neat how animated you become when you tell a story. <laughs> Great, thanks. Steve, can we hear you yet? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Kelly? Yeah. Kelly, I want to add to what Kelly, I'd like to add to what you just said. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, Jeff, so um, I'm convinced that you like doing this and that you're passionate about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that your your energy level and your animation level does not match, do, doesn't show what's really in there. Again, until Kelly pointed out, once you started telling the story, 
Um, yep. You you lit up. You you. I, that's the first time I saw you smile during the fifteen minutes. You okay. got a great smile. You know yeah. we want to see that throughout your 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 workshop and no. um, you you know there there's a combination of being yourself as a trainer. Mm -hmm. You know, and then there's a combination. I actually think sometimes you force yourself not to be yourself. You force yourself to raise your energy level and use your arms and move in a way that you wouldn't uh -huh. normally. And 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 then sometimes you might even lower your voice to emphasize something. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so th there's a combination of being yourself and then let you know forcing yourself to. Uh, bring that uh, to show that energy and that animation and that passion and change the channel for us a little bit. Yeah, it's it's, it's there. You'll do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's also on that line too, Ruben. I, I agree. I wrote I wrote smile as one of my first my first critiques. Like just smile a little bit, and that's what I meant when you can when you change gears from PCA material to telling a story. You smiled, and you were you were looking at us, and you were more engaging. Um, my only other other wish. Is um, when I and I'm doing this because I'm keeping track of time. But through the entire 15 minutes, you asked one question of the yeah. audience. So if I'm in your audience, um, I, you happen to ask me the question, I answer the question. But Steve, Ruben, and all the other 30 people that are in your audience have not been engaged. Yeah. And some of the things I noticed, um, you asked a question and then you answered it yourself. Mm -hmm. so, you know, like what I don't remember exactly what it was, but. You said something along. Was, well, well, well. With the scenario, he gave us the scenario, which is a question: What would you do? And so that's Kelly's point, um, Jeff. There's there's a golden opportunity for your <laughs> for you to step back and yeah. turn it over to the group for a while. And some yeah. of what you would say to us, we will say, and then and you can go, yes, that's right. And and it's it's. You know, when 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 these coaches are saying it to each other, um, it add, it adds so much to the workshop. You you know, and and then Jeff, if some of them say something that's way out of line, that's not such a bad thing either, because it's it's good for others other participants to go, wow, we got a coach that would you know yell and scream at this guy or you know won't tolerate yeah. the, you know whatever. It's good for them to see that there are win at all cost tendencies, even in our own club, even in our own league. Yeah. No, that I makes agree. sense, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, of course. And and with yeah, and, and with what Kelly's talk you know, um, you chose in your demo, um, and you, you used up your fifteen minutes, so it wasn't a bad choice. You you chose um, not to show the videos, because we've seen them. Mm -hmm. um, the, the videos allow for follow-up too. So after you show the video, instead of telling us about the video and what it means, ask us what what does this mean to you? Um, what do you agree with this coach? Yeah. How is this coach different? How is Matt McConaughey different than the the, the first? Ask those questions. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and then, um, and and maybe you would have done that. Maybe you would have done that if you'd actually showed the videos. But uh, but I, the point I wanted to make, I, I got off track. The point I want to make is that that's still not enough, though, Jeff. Even while you're presenting the content, you have to. <laughs> it's funny. I wrote down, don't tell the coaches what they have to do or what they should do. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what you have to do as a trainer. <laughs> Um, you, you, we, we, we as trainers must continue to sprinkle in questions and keep it two-way throughout, even, even during the parts where we're, where, where, where we're telling them what mastery is about. Tough huh? You know? Mm -hmm. Why, so, and, and mistakes are okay. And mistakes are okay. Why do you think PCA would say that mistakes are okay when we're trying to win baseball games? Mm -hmm. Questions, yeah. questions, questions. Definitely. You know, conversation. You know, yeah. Yep. No, it's it's kind of one of those things. You know, and I know it, I'm sure you've been through it at some point. Like, you know, I'm just trying to get my 15 minutes of presentation, and and it's my fault. Yeah, I should have been more aware. You know, making this more realistic. But I guess when as I was preparing, it's it's more of you know, let me show I I kind of know this stuff and mm -hmm. you know and that stuff. So uh, I, I I completely agree. No, it's. That's great feedback. 
And I think that's that's a tough word too. We you know a lot of times we say your presentation, and I think there's a difference. If you had to sit through a two hour presentation, or you were invited to go to a two hour workshop. Which one exactly. would entice you more? You know, a workshop is where you actually get engaged and you get thinking about your team and you start hashing out ideas. Where a presentation is listening to somebody lecture for two hours. So I think that's, so I think that's what I, that's the word I was using. Unfortunately, that's what you know. I, I was telling people, yeah, I have, I have this presentation to yeah. do you know, Wednesday yeah. morning. So, no, Kelly, I mean, what it, do we, it, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Kelly. What do we call it when we communicate with Jeff and Steve and the others in the class? You're going to do a 15 minute what? Um, we probably say presentation. You, so, so we, you and I should think about that. Exactly. What can we replace that with? Yeah. Um, you, you know, because the word presentation works for us, and at the same time, it, it communicates something different than than what we're really looking for. Yeah. And, and Jeff, you know, we're giving you this feedback. You, you were very strong with your fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. Your, your, um, all, all these. This feedback we're giving you, I'm confident you you. First of all, you're aware of it. You're mm -hmm. aware of it, and I'm confident that you you can apply it, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, and and make it the interactive workshop experience that that we all want it to be. Mm -hmm. so you've got you've got a strong strong foundation. I always remind people too that this is not a final exam, like a pass or fail, you know, grade. The feedback yeah. that we give you is in fact feedback that you can use to take with you when you do get out there to do live workshops. We want you to succeed and so, you know, instead of being critical and somebody thinking, "Oh my gosh, I'm failing this whole thing." <laughs> you know, it's not it's not that at all. It's that we're trying to give you feedback based on your personality, which I we think would help you. Definitely. No, yeah, I, I agree and um, kind of going back, I would yes, yeah, I would think of it more as, you know, a mock workshop or or That's whatever. What I should say. Mock workshops a much better way to put it. I'm going to change. Um, no, yeah, I like that a lot, and and the good thing for me is that's kind of what I, you know, live to do is try to get students engaged. Like I said, eighth and ninth graders are not the not the easiest ones to do that. So that's what I mean. I um, yeah, I, yeah. I take this feedback. You know, I like you said, I agree. Um, you know, if I if I'm talking about math for 50, even 15 minutes in a in an hour class, yeah, that I've, I've lost them pretty awesome. much. But right. if I haven't. Um, engaged them. So no, it, it's good for me because that's kind of you know something something that I do and kind of that I'm I'm trained in otherwise. So yeah, and I and I, you know I was a third grade teacher for many many years and also a uh, guidance counselor. I run my workshops like a third grade classroom. I really yeah. do in terms of class management and how I I reiterate and how I get confirmation of content back from the audience. You know, it's the same thing and it's actually it's great. I mean, I live with an eighth and ninth grader. I understand how difficult that is to get them to. Uh -huh anything so you've got the tools there absolutely the only other thing that I wanted to bring up and and I this is um this is something that's just a, a li two little tweaks for you Definitely. because you believe so passionately in this and because you already coach this way sometimes mm -hmm. we fall into the trap of saying I believe okay yep. PCA believes or okay. PCA has has borrowed this research or PCA uses this research so mm -hmm. I, I showed it a couple of times you said you know, I think that mastery is important. I think effort is important. Or I think just gotcha. it's kind of difficult. You, you sort of have to. I mean, it's good to put that in every once in a while, maybe for one of your stories. Mm -hmm. But be careful not to use you because you know Jeff Cola has not done all the research the PCA has mm -hmm. used with other people. So thank that's you. Yeah. And the other thing was, and this is again just practice, but mm -hmm. um, the the um and you knows. <laughs> There's a ton of um and you knows, and that just that just comes with flow too. Definitely. But, yep. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Yep. Did thank you, you Jeff. Quick. Okay. Um, Steve, I don't know what his story is. He said he's going to log off and try to log back on again. Okay. So, if I don't know if you guys want to just sit tight for a second, I'll try to call him back, yeah. and if not, we'll have to schedule his for another time. If yeah. he wants to go, uh, I understand. Jeff, while Jeff, while we wait for Steve, I don't know if you're planning to stay on for Steve. Can Can I yes. tell you a little more, Jeff? Yes, sir. Okay. These are just um, again um, l l little things. I think they're little things, but I think they, they can make a difference. Kelly was talking about uh, the the language, the the ums. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a. I, I don't know if you notice when when I speak, I, I use ums. Uh, there it is. You know, there's my uh. You know, and um, and there it is again. So I I I did not notice the ums. Um, 
I did not notice. What I noticed was the, the, the term kind of. You used it twice, and I, I, I would try to mm -hmm. eliminate it. So the, yeah. the first principle, coaches kind of should, kind of should. You know, uh, we believe coaches should, or we believe coaching involves kind of, kind of, takes away the credibility, right? It's, sure. oh, he's not sure about this. Does he really believe this? Yeah. So, so, and then the same thing with um, uh, kind of remind ourselves. When did you use that phrase? Oh, oh, it's the uh, mistake ritual when you're explaining the mistake ritual. Mistake yeah. ritual is a physical gesture we use to kind of remind ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> just, just take out the word kind of. Yep. We, we use it to remind ourselves that mm -hmm. mistakes are okay. And to help us move forward, definitely. So, so you know, um, kind of is going to slip in there for you sometimes. But if you try to try to make it part of your awareness and, and, and try to work it out, definitely. No, I, yeah. I appreciate. Okay. It. Yeah, That's it's a it's a little thing. Um, let me see if there was anything else. Kelly, can, can I can I keep going or am I holding us up? I think she looks like she's on the phone yeah, with Steve. She, she's on the phone. So so. Um, the, the the Joan Duda research, the Olympic athletes. Yes. Um, uh, the answer the answer two, right? That's what we 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 firmly believe that it's answer two, and the reason is that Joan the Joan Duda's research is one example of over twenty five years of research in and outside of sports that has the same conclusion over and over and over. It's like Groundhog Day. All, all these studies in school, in sports, in business show over and over that what is called a mastery focus okay, yeah. process produces better results. It produces better performance. It produces more wins in sports. Definitely. Yeah, you know, that gives – because Joan Duda – Joan Duda, is, it, it's a great example, but that's all it is. It's one example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's part of this huge – it's a part of this overwhelming body of – and in fact, Jeff, in fact, Jeff, uh, many of our trainers, we use the, the, the language that, you know, some things in sports psychology are controversial. This is something that is non-controversial. Sports psychologists, experts all over the country agree that mastery, more of an emphasis on, more of a focus on mastery, produces better results than a, a scoreboard focus. Definitely. Kelly, Great. am I holding this up? Nope, you're good. Okay. I'm just taking advantage of the time. Jeff, I, I usually uh, don't get the chance to... Uh, Give this detail because you know we got a tight time frame and uh, yeah, I'm the privileged so, one. That's great. That's great. <laughs> um, what else is there? Anything else? No, I was telling Jeff there's a lot of workshops coming up in the next few weeks in Cleveland. Nick Sipkis just got back to me last week and said, you know, there's a ton of them coming up soon, and I actually sent it to Jeff. So the good news is, is there's a lot of opportunities for you to get out there. And yeah. have you been to a, a full workshop yet? Um, I have not, other than the one uh, Jim gave to us, uh, to me, you know, listening. Okay, because what I might encourage you to do is observe a full workshop from beginning to uh -huh. end, and then after that, um, you know, you can talk to the trainer. I already spoke to Marty Mordowski, who does a lot of workshops out there, and he said okay. he's happy to have anybody come in and observe or, or co-present with him. So um, I think going out to observe a full workshop from beginning to end just to see the flow and how, how you know, how Marty or somebody gets the audience engaged. And then the next step would be for you to co-present a portion, similar to today. You would just take uh, one of the principles and, and co-present that part. And then whoever the, the veteran trainer is there would decide the next steps for that as well. Okay, so great. The good news is when I was doing this a year ago, training Cleveland trainers, there were barely any workshops. So now they're really it's really picking up, which is great. No, that's great. And then I'll be, um, I'll be there... For their uh, the partner um, symposium on on this Saturday. Oh um, great! So I'll see Jim and those guys on Saturday. 
That's great. Kelly, do you know about that event, this partner I, symposium? That they you put know what? Together? Jen asked me about coming out to do it, but I'm already yeah. going to be in Tampa. Yeah. So. yeah, so you know about it. Um, and yeah. then, Kelly, you'll be the Oprah. Uh, Jeff, we use that term. That's a, a Jim Thompson PCAism that comes from, uh, uh, I don't know what, where it comes. Oh, it comes from Jim Al Jim Cal uh -huh. Comes from some 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 book that we've read. Any uh, one person ultimately responsible, Oprah. Uh, Kelly, you will you will guide Jeff's um, movement forward, right? Be yes. Being that he's in Cleveland. Yeah. Okay. So, so so Kelly, I want you to know, and and I, I completely trust your judgment, and I know you 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 work so well with with trainers, and you'll work with you. Uh, I I personally would be okay if there is an opportunity for Jeff to immediately. Uh, co-present as an associate trainer before he observes an entire workshop. Okay. I, I'm I'm okay with that uh, based on what Jeff showed us today. Okay. Um, and, you know, and and if he does co-present, it could be something where he you know he presents Elm one principle, and mm -hmm. then he still gets the op the opportunity to observe the rest of the workshop. Yeah, that's true. So so, so, I, so I'm okay with that. I'm okay with either he observes and then co-presents. Or that you move them straight into co-presenting. Okay. All right. Does that sound good to you, Jeff? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, either, either whichever you know opportunity kind of comes up first, and and what you guys think is best. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely open. Okay. Do you still live in the Strongsville area now? I do. I'm I'm between um, the yeah Cleveland Strongsville Akron area. I'm I'm all around. So. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right, then what we'll do is we'll get you into our system as an associate trainer, and right. um, and then we'll we'll talk to you about how to get you out there and how to get you. And if you you know if you feel comfortable co-presenting, that's that's a great recommendation, Ruben. I'd love to have him do that. Perfect. It it, it, may, it may be dictated by the calendar and the workshops, Jeff. Yeah. There's some workshops that lend themselves to mm -hmm. to plugging in a, a, a trainer in training like you. And there's some where it's just not the right workshop to do it. So, so Kelly will be aware of that. And yeah, um, yeah. Hey, um, so Kelly, what are we going to do? Is Steve going to join us? Or you we... know, he's very frustrated. He was laughing. He said, "I got up early. I even showered." And uh... <laughs> so, <laughs> should we? So, so we don't even want to try to do it by by telephone with Steve. Well, um, I guess we can. Um, he's just having computer issues. It was working fine, and now it's not. So. Um, hey, has he has he moved on? Has he moved on? Basically, no. He's think? he's still trying to get back on again. But I don't want to hold you guys up. What, um, what if we did it via, via phone? I mean, what if like he have him present to us over the phone? All right, let me call him and see. Or even if we can just hear him over the phone or something. Yeah. Oh, there he is. He's trying again. Yeah, we don't have to see him. I mean, it's yeah. it's nice to see him, but we don't have to. In I fact, I've me. seen. Hi there. Um, can you hear me? You know, we can hear you now, Steve. And Ruben was saying, if you want to just present, I mean, it's nice to see you, but we don't have to see you. We can hear you right now on the computer if you want to just go that way. Can I be, can I be, uh, just, this really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. I don't know why, because when I click on my USB uh, icon, it shows me talking to myself. <laughs> and when I come back here to the Hangout, it's not giving you my picture for some reason, and I don't know why. And I've done... Steve, can you hear? still hear us? He must have a loose connection somewhere, I'm thinking. Okay, Kelly, here's how I would think we should approach this. Yeah. Opportunity. Yeah. Workshops. Things go wrong. Yeah, Sometimes absolutely. technology doesn't work. Sometimes... Steve, can you hear us? He can hear us. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to call you, Steve, and I'm going to put you on speakerphone, on my cell phone, so that we can see you, and then we can hear you through my, my cell phone. So I'm going to call you, and we're going to do it that way. Actually, I'm going to get my other phone. Hold on one second, because it's louder. So Jeff, the point I'm, I, I want to make is that as a trainer, mm -hmm. occasionally everything will be just right and go smoothly. Occasionally. occasionally. The norm is that something isn't quite right. The room is a bad setup. Uh, they, they've got uh, daycare 
uh, in the room next door and the wall's really thin and you have to talk over the, you know, the screen. You, you, there's always yeah. something. And, yeah, for sure. Again, that's something. You know, so, so what I want to encourage Steve to do is to approach it that way. Okay, we ran yeah. into a snag. Of we, we've got to deliver a workshop here. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so let's, we're going to find a way to deliver this. Can you hear me? Walk. Yes, I have right. you on the speakerphone now. Okay. Uh, but we're getting echo feedback here. So, Steve, why don't you turn your sound off? Go up to the top of your screen and turn your microphone off. Okay. Now that's yeah, just echo feedback. Is that better? That's better. So we can hear you. Okay, so you want me to jump right into it? I think that would be great. <laughs> uh, okay. So I did learn a lesson from uh, our practice run last week where my introduction ran long. So what you suggested I do was for you to do the introduction of me before I introduce myself. Mm -hmm. While I was watching Jeff, I was thinking that I should have sent you a, uh, my page for your my bio, and then you could have actually read it like you were introducing me to an audience. But I'll be the, be the uh, uh, league official that's going to be introducing me. So uh, I'll jump right into it. And so good evening, folks and coaches, and thank you for attending. Our presenter today for our Positive Coaching Alliance uh, Double Goal Coaching Workshop is Steve Abrams. Let me give you some background on Steve. Steve has coached sports for 28 years. He's always had a vision to see athletes compete with character in its competition, even when it meant losing on the scoreboard. Steve played all sports as a kid, Little League Baseball, Basketball, Football, Soccer, you name it, he played it. Steve played varsity football for Cordova High School back in 1979 when his team went 13-0, and and they were ranked number one in California and number four in the nation. Steve then went on to play college football at both Sierra College and Sacramento State. Steve has lived in Elk Grove for 28 years and has served in a variety of youth leadership and coaching roles, including on the board and as head coach for Elk Grove, Cal Ripken, Laguna Youth Baseball, and Elk Grove Bay Ruth. Steve has also been a head coach for National Junior Basketball and Laguna Youth Soccer. For 10 years, Steve was an assistant coach for Laguna Creek High School Varsity Football, and for six years with the Laguna Creek, Franklin, and Consumer Dumps Junior Football Programs. Steve is certified with Positive Coaching Alliance, the American Baseball Coaches Association, the Cal Ripken Way for Bay Ruth, National Federation of State High School Association, California Youth Soccer Association, and the National Youth Sports Association. Steve has two sons, Cameron, who is 21 and attends Tabor University in Kansas on a baseball scholarship, and Cooper, 19, who played varsity football at Consumers River High School and now attends San Diego State University. So coaches, please join me in welcoming Steve Abrams. Uh, Coach, thank you very much for that great introduction. <laughs> Good evening, coaches, and thank you for your time. You know, I want to first off and thank you for your commitment and sacrifice to coach. I know it takes a lot, and I know many of you tonight are sacrificing your time with your family and a time at home to be here. I understand how important it is, so tonight I will do my best to give you my best and make it worthwhile for you. Here's my personal message to you, coaches. As you heard in the introduction, I coach in sports for 28 years, and I've always had a vision and a passion to see athletes and coaches and parents compete with character in mixed competition. Even when I met losing on the scoreboard, and many times I was not the most popular coach on the field because of that. So let me get across. We're going to do this workshop tonight. We're going to do this together. I've been right there in the seats with you. I've been in the trenches and on the benches. I've experienced what you are experiencing and what you will experience during your time as a coach. You will someday come face to face with challenges on or off the field that will challenge your character against intense competition. And at that moment, I want you to become inspired to do 
what is right. I want you to embrace all that this experience has to offer, which includes enjoying every single moment that you're out there coaching your players, and for many of you, your sons and daughters also. I promise you it's going to go by in a blink of an eye. So how about we agree to my coaches that during our time together, we lead with an everlasting positive impact on those children that we're going to coach. So let me tell you what a double goal coach is. A double goal coach is someone who prepares athletes to win and teaches life lessons through sports. And that is what this workshop is all about tonight. The mission of the PC is to transform new sports so that sports can transform you. And helping you as coaches realize the positive impact a character-focused coach can have on your players, and this is very important, not just for this season, but for a lifetime. Many of you I know are already modeling PCA goals, and this workshop will reinforce what you already know and introduce some new tools into your toolbox. And so my job is to give you some insight and understanding that there's no more powerful legacy that you can leave than helping your young people realize their potential as well as being good athletes. Simply put, I want you to be that coach who your players will remember for that positive impact you had on them. Now, first, before we even get started, I want you to take out your books. Everybody has a book. I want you to open the front cover and write your answer to this question. I only want you to take maybe one minute. My question to you is this, coaches. How do I want to be remembered as a coach? So take your time. Write that in there. Okay, now, I want you to turn to the person next to you, coaches, and I want you to share with the person next to you on your left or your right what you wrote. Share your answers. Very good. Now, coaches, give me some feedback. I want, I want to hear from you. Tell me, anybody here would like to share? I want to be remembered as a good teacher. Very good. Thank you, Ruben. Now, let me, let me explain the... And I'm, and on the side note, I'm rushing a little bit. Don't rush. So, okay. Don't rush. So let me explain the power of double goal coaching for you. A double goal coach is a coach who prepares athletes to win and teaches life lessons through sports. Now, coaches, can I get a shake of your head? Isn't that the type of coach that you want to be? Right? right. A double goal coach never loses sight of that unique opportunity you as a coach has to teach the important aspects of life and their enormous potential to impact lives. So tonight I want to encourage your participation. We all want to set a tone where we create and share some stories. We interact with our thoughts. Uh, your input is respected. Everybody's going to listen. Can I get a, an agreement, everybody, that you'd like to participate tonight? Can I shake it? Can I shake it? Thank you. So let me explain the relationships to this book I have, I encourage you to use this book often. Open it up, read through, take notes, dog ear the pages, use this as a lifelong reference. Okay, so that would be my end of my intro before I went into the first principle. So then I would transfer it and I'd say, okay, coaches, now we just got through with uh, e-tanks. We learned how to fill emotional tanks. Now we're going to enter into the third principle, and that is honoring the game. But let me also say, before we move on, you, you coaches are doing a great job so far. Thanks so much for all your feedback. Um, uh, your participation means so much to the success of this course. Uh, in fact, what I want you all to do right now is everybody stand up, and I just want you to stretch. Okay, we stretch. All right, get a breath of fresh air. Two, stretch. All right, back down again. All right, here we go. Honoring the game. So that's our slide 26, which is our Mallory moment. Has anyone seen the scenario? It was played out on ESPN, newscasts everywhere. Can anybody tell me what this uh, this picture represents? Yeah, that's the girl who hit it over the fence, um, but she got hurt running around the bases. And so uh, I, th I think the other team actually ended up helping her around the bases, something like that? Yeah, that's, that's very good. You, you got it right on there, Ruben. Uh, Mallory Holden gained national attention. She was a softball player for Central Washington. 
And she assisted an opposing player and helped her score a home run. When an injury prevented her, she uh, came up to bat and she hit a home run. And rallying first base, she injured her knee to the point where she could not round the bases. Uh, Mallory saw that she didn't want the game to be decided by this injury, so she went to the officials and asked the officials that her and her teammates could help carry her around the bases. So what they did is Mallory and another teammate, Kate, uh, uh, her name was Laura Chichalski, and uh, picked her up and dropped her down on second base and dropped her down on third base and dropped her down on fourth base, gently dropping her legs at each uh, base that they passed and allowed her to uh, score a home run or hit a home run. And, you know, that was just an amazing display of sportsmanship. And tell me, coaches, uh, how do you think uh, sports media handles Mallory moment versus negative action in the headlines, in the news media? Hmm. Probably not as much. Not as much. Right. How about you, Ruben? Could you repeat the question? Sure. How do you think the sports news media handles uh, Mallory moments versus negative headlines? Oh, I think I think the negative gets uh, we we see much more of the negative. We we see if there's a brawl, we're going to see it. Something like this um, could get could get hidden. Right. And over the past couple of weeks, also we heard about it the play the game, right? But how many gallery moments have happened in all different avenues of sports? College athletics, high school athletics. There's basketball that's going on right now. A lot of different sports, but we're not focusing on that. Coaches, now I want you to share with me. Tell me, have any of you have ever experienced the Mallory moments during your your coaching career? I had a moment when I was coaching youth lacrosse where I had a player named Madison that was not one of our strongest players, and she, I gave equal playing time for everyone. And it was the last game of the season, and Madison was the only one on the team that had never scored a goal. And she already played in the entire first half. And one of the girls on my team who was the high scorer asked if she could come out so that Madison could go in in the second half so that she could have a chance to score a goal. And she rallied the whole team to keep passing the ball to Madison. And we were actually losing at the time. So it was hard for me to take out my best player to put in Madison. But we decided to do it, and unfortunately, she didn't score a goal. But it was still a good, it was a good opportunity. Yeah, that's a great feel-good moment. Thank you for sharing it with that, Kelly. If does anybody else have a, a Mallory moment they'd like to share? No, I just uh, go. Go ahead, I Jeff. Always, I just always remember kind of the way Kelly described rallying around. It's it's rallying around, you know, certain players that that didn't. Get to play a whole lot in college, and and you know it's not you know at the level of a Mallory moment, but it's that feel good moment for for other players. Um, you know, really really cheering on, and, and you know in a in a real genuine way of you know letting players know that they're you're behind them, and you know want them to succeed. So no, it's great. great. That's that's great, Jeff. Thank you very much. You know, I'm going to share you a little passage in the book. I've read this book several times during my training, and if you turn to page 43, at the bottom of page 43, there's a paragraph, and I just want to read this to you, and it sort of encompasses of what the results of honoring the game can produce. And it says, if we want family members who help each other achieve their dreams, neighbors who are friendly and pitch in, business owners who pursue profit ethically, people from different traditions and backgrounds who respect one another. In short, if we want everyday decency in our society, then we can begin by teaching our youth how to compete in sports with grace and humility. And you know, I think that's very really powerful. You're going to find a lot of passages in the book. So now we're going to go to the next slide, and that's going to be roots. And there are five key areas of honoring the game that PCA uh, wants to teach and model, and they are, one is R, respect the rules. 
So, respecting the rules. What does respecting the rules, coaches, what do you think that means to you, respecting the rules? Not cheating. Not cheating. Um, and why do we respect rules? Why, why, why do we uh, have rules? What, what do rules do for us and do for the game? They keep it safe and fair. Correct. Fairness. Fairness, especially in youth sports, right? How about safety? How about protection? Giving structure for the teams to play under. Does anybody here know maybe a rule in your league that sometimes gets bent? And when you have a mental conflict between coaches, when one coach is trying to coach exactly by the rule book and another coach is trying to bend the rules, how do, you, how do you guys handle that? Because that's going to happen sometimes. So the next... Uh, Letter in the roots is opponents, respecting your opponents. We are their gifts to us, appreciate their efforts. And more importantly, understand that they are someone's child. They are your friends, children, they're your children's schoolmates, they are your players' teammates on other teams. Just because you're playing against each other in a baseball game doesn't mean that those children over there might not be teammates on a soccer or a basketball or a lacrosse team. We want you to coach your teams to compete both friendly and fiercely. And we believe that can happen. That is possible. You know, I've always had a question I ask, why do coaches think we hate this team? Hmm. Is it hate such a strong word? You know? There are going to be games when your opponent does not honor the game. How are you going to handle that challenge? And that's what we're going to work on today. What happens when the other team trash talks or doesn't show a sportsmanship? For example, what happens when one of your players gets knocked down uh, with an infraction of a rule, but it doesn't get called? Or they're showing bad sportsmanship. How, how do you approach your players with that? How do you tell them to react? And guess what? Your players are going to look at you and see how you handle it. And the way you handle it and the way you model it is the way they are going to handle it. So let's move to the other O, and that's officials. Two more minutes. Respect yeah. officials. So how do we have such, why do we have such the same for officials? Sometimes they are you. They're doing their best. We watch professional sports. Do they make the right call every time? No. No, so why do we expect a 16-year-old umpire mm -hmm. to make the right call every time? Okay, so also respect your teammates is the T and their contributions. Remember the old adage, the team is only as strong as the weakest link. So we have to model for our teammates to help them bring the best out of each other. And the last is respect yourself with your efforts and your attitude. I tell my boys when they were growing up, and you guys can use this if you like, that everybody out there is not guided by the same moral compass. As a coach, you will need to constantly model and remind your players and yourself, if you win by dishonoring the game, really what value is that victory? And I know I'm running short on time, so I'm going to get through this here. Remember, by following the rules, you're helping build a triple impact competitor. And that's an athlete who makes themselves, their teammates, and the game better. Now, we're going to move into culture. And here at PCA, culture is the way we do things here. So I'm going to ask you a question. What is your team culture? How do you set your team culture? <clears throat> when do you think you start to build your team culture? And Kelly, move it. I'm going to just fly through these real quick to, just so I can finish these, but I would mm -hmm. expand a little bit more. A, cult, a culture is how players, parents, and opponents, and, and officials carry themselves on and off the field. So uh, my question to you, coaches, is how do you think you can establish a team culture? Or I even challenge you as a group, how do you establish a league culture? 
Now, if we turn to page 46, is our Honor the Game Toolkit in our book. And this helps you and gives you uh, to help prepare yourself with self-control routines. Questions are ways to implement self-control routines. I would ask the coaches, give me some ideas. Breathing, counting to five. Sometimes it can get very heated. So if you practice this, coaches, when it actual the challenge comes during the game, you are mentally prepared. Then I would ask you a question. Think about a situation where you could have improved your reaction. Well, sorry. I'm sorry. If you want to finish your sentence, go ahead. I don't want to interrupt you. Okay, I, I just I just have a couple of uh, points to make. I would do a role play, uh, and I would practice with the reaction. I would uh, make a bad call and ask the coaches to give me some positive or or negative reactions to my call. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then on pages 47 to 51, the book gives you several different tools to use when addressing your players. I like number two, seizing teachable moments. And number one, setting expectations at your parent meeting. I think that's so powerful to set expectations to your parents and your players about how you expect the reaction and how you are going to model the game when those challenges arise. So remember, start by establishing roots with your players and parents before the season begins. Reinforce teachable moments and look for that Mallory moment. Your eyes are on you all the time. And remember, and you guys know this, it doesn't feel better. It, it always feels better to do the right thing. Especially when you look at that mirror before you go to bed at night knowing you can rest each and tell yourself, I did things the right way. Because in the long run, it really doesn't matter arguing balls and strikes, especially to your players. Review roots, respect rules, officials, opponents, teammates. And I want to close with this. Honor comes in many forms, not only in sports, but in your family and in your workplace. And the most important members of the team are not always the smartest or the most skilled or the most powerful. Their power is in their attitude and their ability to energize and encourage others with optimism, enthusiasm, and determination. Remind yourself that character counts. You can go against the grain and help be a positive change agent by modeling and teaching your players and their parents to honor the game. Coaches, I, I know I got a little long-winded. I apologize. I have to use the restroom or what have you, but excellent job, everyone, and thanks again for sharing. Nice job. How'd you think? Now, how did you think? What? Somebody challenged me out there because I, I shouldn't have to go through the anxiety of trying to get these connections going. <laughs> well, it's crazy. It's the same kind of anxiety I feel every time I hook my projector up to my laptop and pray that it's going to work. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I just don't understand it. And I've had, I, I forgot my charging cord one time, and I had to do 90% of the workshop with no PowerPoint. Um, you know, I mean, it happens. The speakers don't work. You know, I, I lost a bulb one time. I don't keep an extra bulb around for my projector. I mean, these things happen. And, you know, the one thing that, that I think Ruben brought to the point, too, just because you get set back 15 minutes, you could be set, set back because the room's not ready, whatever it is. That doesn't mean you necessarily have to rush through to get it all in. You know, you don't want the you don't want the audience to feel like they're getting cheated. It's not their fault that the technology didn't work or you were pushed aside. So you just have to kind of calm down and just say, okay, I might have to take out a few stories or change one of my activities. So Well I really appreciate your patience waiting for me to get hooked up this morning. <laughs> That's okay. As Ruben said, occasionally things go smoothly with no hiccups. <laughs> All right. Um, how about how about some positives, Jeff and, and Ruben? Um, there's a lot of stuff. I think the 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 biggest part was again that that intro. Um, the thank you, you know, for for being coaches and and all that. That's actually it's probably more powerful than you think. Um, and obviously you put it in there for good reason. But I think that's that's a great thing. Um. And just your opening message of, of what you wanted to get accomplished, and and again that that kind of thank you. Um, I really enjoyed that. That kind of got me pumped up and you know ready. To go. So, that was great. Yeah, 
Yeah. So, so, um, I, I, There's feedback, but I think you can still hear. So I think um, a, a strong positive is, Steve, it's so clear that you have put a lot of thought and preparation into what you're going to do with this, this piece of the workshop. A lot of thought and a lot of preparation. I, and so then I'll, I'll follow up on that a little later, too. But I think that's a pause. I mean, clearly, Steve, you're 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 working very hard at this, and you're you're putting a lot into it. Thank you. It's the feedback from the phone. It's getting a the sound from the computer and then taking it through the phone. So that's the feedback of that. Sorry, guys. Um, I think I think. In addition to what Jeff said, I agree with your your intro is very powerful. It makes me want to listen to you. Which intro are you talking about, Kelly? Are you talking about the the intro that the the the, the read about? No, yeah. I mean that. You're talking that about the next op his opening statement. Yeah, just validating that he's been through what the coaches have been through. That you know you've had these challenges you are a lot of you already coach with these methods i think that's really important or i don't want to say buy in but i think that's what it is you're establishing that you've been there so i think that's really good um, also maybe Ruben and Jen, you just put it on mute for a second that might help i don't know if that'll help with the feedback or not maybe i should put it on mute i don't know but <laughs> We might just have to do feedback after this because this is crazy. Um, but I think also you use the book as a resource very, very well, better than a lot of veteran trainers that I've seen. Um, you make me want to dive into the book. You use great examples. You read some of the quotes. And I think you know a lot of the partner managers for PCA will say the book is a very powerful resource, and it's actually something that the partners have purchased. And if you go through an entire workshop and don't mention the value of the book, the partner's thinking, wait, I just spent hundreds of dollars on these books for all my coaches, and they don't even know what to do with it. So I thought that was really that was really great the way you did that. Kelly, can I interrupt you? Because I have a, uh, at, in two minutes, I have to, at now one minute, I have to go. Oh, I just want to say a couple more things. Hey, um, uh, Steve, I think, I think, um, I think you're trying to do too much. Believe it or not, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the, the the preparation and the thought, and I, I think you're trying to give us too much. I I think less is going to be more for you, and I agree that that opening statement that we both Jeff and Kelly referred to has some power to it. I think that it needs to be shorter, and I all or I think it can be broken up into an opening statement at the beginning of your workshop and then you come back and finish it at the end of the workshop. You, um, Steve, you have a, a, a bit of, a bit of um, I, I don't know what the word, I'm going to use the word you're preaching to us about, you're, you're appealing to, you're appealing to us our emotions and our, our desire to want to do the right thing. You do that throughout. It comes through over and over and over. And and I think it's good. And I think it's too much. I think I think there should be a a, a couple pieces of that. Um, and maybe Kelly or Jeff has a better way of, of expressing that than, than I'm expressing it right now. But it, it it feels like too much to me. Okay. And uh, I think I think that. There are a lot of ingredients in what you did today and what you did last week when I was with you that are going to uh, allow you to be a good, effective trainer. Um, I, I actually think we need to scale a little, so some of it back a little. So um, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Kelly and Jeff. If I, if